Hey, Guillermo, Tyler, how you doing? Hi there. Surviving? Oh yeah. Yeah, here come Lyle and uh, Eli and Lyle. All right, whoops. There we go. All right, <laughs> if, I, if I suddenly pause in the middle of everything, it says my mouse batteries are low so there's a chance i'll freeze up but uh let's push it a bit oh okay um yeah we need <laughs> we need a few more weeks uh but what i'm hoping is that i can get you uh, through the Feynman rules for qed and some techniques for uh reducing the resultant amplitudes to actual predictions and um, then uh, let you work. I, I think I'm, uh, let's see what's going on here. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, my, my internet seems to be searching for something. What is there? Oh, there it goes. Okay, so uh, let me just launch into it. Now, uh, I think maybe the best way for me to do this, because some of these expressions are really long, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and if you see if you see anybody trying to come in, let's see who's who's not here. Uh, anyway, uh, do you all see this uh, chapter ten? You got it. Okay, good. Yep. All right. So, um, oh boy, let's see. We're going to modify this action in one way. Uh, we're going to change electromagnetism. Now, did I get through that last time? The the Gupta Bloiler, Gupta Bloiler quantization of E and M. Uh, okay, nobody's fervently shaking their head. Yes. Um, did we do the Dirac? Pro where, where did we leave off? Here's the Dirac propagator. Um, so the Dirac equation, you you do a Fourier transform as we did before. And we're interested in the Fourier transform of the whole thing. So we, we really just have to then solve um, this, this equation. So if you substitute the Fourier transforms, there's, there's one unusual thing here that turns out to be important. And I, yeah, I was trying to make sense of all this because uh, most of the books don't go into this, but this G is being acted on by, uh, among other things, gamma matrices. So this G has to, to live in that complex uh, vector space. It's actually a tensor. So um, what, what this says, there's, there's an identity matrix over on the right side of this. And uh, that G is a matrix times the gamma matrix here and the identity with the M. Uh, has to give an identity matrix on the right. So substituting the Fourier transforms of each, we get a simple expression, um, K slash minus M, after you take the derivative uh, acting on G, um, the Fourier transform of that minus I. So since Fourier transforms are invertible, we uh, have to have the term in parentheses vanishing. And uh, there are several ways to write this, but um, basically what you want to do is divide by K slash minus M, but that's not quite legal. What you really do is you multiply by K, K slash plus M. Um, that, that gives a factor of K squared minus M squared here. And uh, so what you're actually getting on, on the right, um, once you multiply by K slash plus, um, plus M is, I k slash plus m over k squared plus m squared. 
case. Uh, I think, no, that should be, uh, let me think, is it plus or minus here? I uh, probably need to check that. Um, let, me, let me think, k slash, k slash, k slash is gonna be plus k squared. So yeah, that, that should be a minus sign right there. Um, okay, so what we then need is uh, a, a covariant quantization of the photon. Um, what we did before was to choose a gauge and we showed that we could uh, restrict the um, uh, photon field uh, by gauge invariance down to simply the transverse modes. But that means you're now working with some uh, expressions, particularly for the interaction back here. The interaction term we're going to be interested in QED is this, between the photon and say the electron wave functions here or positron or quark, those could be any fermion interacting with light. So any charged fermion uh, will, will have a term like this and will then um, scatter with photons. So the rest of this is just the, um, the free particle Lagrangian. So remember, we're going to divide things up into a free Hamiltonian, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there should be one more person, um, into a, a free Hamiltonian, which is what I have not highlighted here the Dirac expression and the F squared for the free fields and an interaction term where those fields interact with one another. We're gonna be developing a perturbation theory for handling that interaction. So we solve for the green function or propagator for the Dirac field. And that's, that's straightforward, um, except for the minus sign here. Uh, it's, it's just this, it's, it's usually written this way one over k, i over k slash minus m. Um, that's shorthand for i k slash plus m divided by k squared minus m. Uh, that should be a minus. Okay, now for the photon, uh, to keep it covariant, what is um, one approach, uh, a better approach is BRST where you supersymmetrize uh, the, um, the fields, you add some anti-commuting fields and uh, keep that symmetry throughout the quantization. Here, we're gonna add a term that breaks the gauge invariance, all right? So this, uh, this, this term would vanish if we impose the Lorentz gauge condition. Uh, it doesn't vanish here, but um, we're gonna keep that and show how we can make predictions in a way that does not depend on this um, constant psi. Certainly this approaches Maxwell theory if we take psi to infinity, but what we're gonna do is structure things so that all of our physical predictions are independent of psi, and I'll show you how we're gonna do that. So uh, this, is, this is a technique due to Gupta and Euler. Now, uh, what adding this term means is that we no longer have the problem of a vanishing conjugate momentum for the time component of the vector potential. All four components now participate in all of the calculations. So we just follow through with that and we'll deal with uh, the um, making things depend on just the transverse modes later. So we go ahead and we quantize this. We find the canonical brackets and now notice that it's, uh, it is um, covariant, right? This is the equal time Poisson bracket and the constant over here. Now we don't have a projection. We've got the nice uh, Lorentz invariant metric eta. Uh, if we vary the vector potential, okay, you know how to find field equations by varying potentials. And here it turns out to be, uh, this is a D'Alembertian of A, but then you have this gauge dependent term. Or, you know, this sign is often called gauge it's not really a gauge choice, um, but uh, can be given any value. So it, it, is, it is a freedom in your choice of action, really. You're considering a whole class of theories at once. But this is the gradient of a divergence, and this is the D'Alembertian of the field. And the nice thing here, if you extract that as a matrix acting on second derivatives of A, 
this this thing in parentheses is now invertible. So uh, th there's this distinction I should draw between projections and invertible matrix operators, right? Uh, you know, a, a way to show that you cannot solve an equation is to show that you've got some matrix coefficient like this that is a projection. And that was the case back with the um, first quantization of EM we did. Uh, here, this, this operator for any non zero psi or non infinite psi is invertible. So, so we can solve for everything. All right. Um, this means we can do our usual sort of Fourier expansion for A, and all four components now play a role. So, when, when we write, uh, oh, let's see, where do I do it here? Um, yeah, down, down here, I'm going to write A, the Fourier modes as a set of basis um, polarizations, like we did before, but now there are four polarizations um, times the, the, um, the amplitude. So let me see, what am I doing here? Um, I, I want to move a little quickly through this. This has been online. Have you guys had a chance to read uh, the, the notes I posted last week? Some of you were caught up. Um, Eli, Alex, no, everybody's uh, some of you looking sheepish, some of you nodding eagerly. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Okay, good. Yes. Um, well, do it because, you know, all this is already in there. I'm going to post some more uh, as soon as I can. Um, anyway, we, we get uh, the condition on the wave vector in order to satisfy the uh, the field equation. Um, it's box minus grad of the divergence, and here the divergence doesn't vanish. So we have some kind of a constraint on the wave vector. Um, in fact, what we're going to do is choose this psi equal to one, so this, this term just vanishes, and uh, we just have k squared equals zero, just a plane wave, and that actually works. Okay, so we separate out polarization. So we have four uh, orthogonal uh, unit vectors, um, one of them time-like, one of them longitudinal, uh, whereby longitudinal I mean in the direction of the wave vector, the direction the wave is traveling, and then two transverse. Oops, oh, didn't mean to do that. Um, let's see, come back here. All right, uh, so um, looking at the Fourier transform uh, here with um, omega k now determined by the condition k squared equals zero uh, when we choose psi equal one, the, um, we, we usually find the conjugate momenta. Now, the conjugate momentum pi naught to a naught uh, is it's, um, it's basically k dotted into the polarization vectors that singles out uh, uh, one, one direction of polarization. It's a time-like polarization or an, really a null polarization. I write that as uh, the frequency omega k times a unit null vector. So that unit null vector will look something like this where uh, the three vector n hat is any um, any unit three vector, uh, and then uh, you get k just by adding a um, a magnitude the frequency h bar omega really. Okay, now so uh, I'm going to write a lot of this in terms of this this null vector u. Uh, the polarization satisfy a a um, completeness relation. If we take their inner product for different lambdas, uh, that's, uh, that, that builds eta again. Now, uh, the, um, the, the, the variable in parentheses here is a label for which polarization, but we're going to treat it very much like a Lorentz index because uh, we've set it up to act that way. So our polarization satisfy this, uh, essentially a Lorentz invariant condition. Um, if you have circular polarization where you wanna take the polarization vector 
um, complex than, than the condition, you have to add the thing to its complex conjugate to get eta. <clears throat> um, for most of what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take these to be just one zero 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 one zero zero and so on, just unit vectors. Okay, I see people taking some deep breaths. I'll pause. You have questions? What are you guys doing? You with me here? Uh, do you have a question? Anybody? Okay. So, so um, I kind of do, I guess. Uh, so since k is null, does that does that make omega like an affine parameterization? I'm kind of struggling with the differences between that and a actual parameterization. But isn't there some subtlety with normalizing null vectors? That's what I was trying to fish for. Uh, yeah, well, you can pick any one component, right? So, well, let's see, no. You, you've got, um, let's see, how to say this, a, uh, a null four vector, um, you know, has Lorentz norm zero, but has non-zero components. So you know, th this is how, for example, the photon can have zero mass and yet have energy and momentum. So the the time component of the four momentum is uh, proportional, you know, is the energy of the photon h bar omega. The spatial parts are h bar k, the the momentum of the photon, and uh, there's um, there's no there's no problem factoring out uh, any any magnitude you like. Um, Let's see, by a unit null vector, I mean a null vector with time component one. All right, so, uh, you know, you, you, need, you need some, uh, you need to specify which vector because, because of the space-time signature, uh, the energy term dominates. And so pulling out the magnitude of the energy term uh, always leaves you with uh, a, um, a consistent way to parameterize the, uh, the magnitude. I don't know if that helps. Does that help? I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, um, affine parameter, yeah, well, okay. So null vectors uh, often in space-time um, problems you, you can rescale a null vector, it's still a null vector in the same direction. So you don't care about that. If you're talking about a momentum, uh, a null momentum four vector, you do care about the size of the components because they physically are the energy and momentum. So, um, so- That's kind of what I, yeah, yeah sorry. It's kind of yeah. that the, the coupling up above is what you're getting the actual value of K from. Is that, is that where I'm misreading it? Yeah, so uh, coupling up above. Um, like that, maybe is it that K squared? That's kind of what I was saying, maybe. Yeah, K, all right, K squared, K squared is zero. It, it wouldn't have to be. We could, if I didn't take psi here equal to one, um, then K squared would be equal to something else, right? Yeah, K, K would just satisfy that equation. But um, it's, uh, we're, we're gonna show that actually any value of psi here is um, is equivalent, so we might as well take it to be one, and that's what sets k squared to zero. It's that choice. Um, basically, we're solving we're solving the field equation for a right there. But um, okay, the uh, uh, you mentioned an affine parameter. You know, we we can't rescale this and be talking about the same for momentum. So we can't we can't just multiply our for our null vector by some arbitrary parameter. Oh boy, I'm running off the page. I thought I fixed this. Am I? I wonder if I'm looking at the most recent copy here. I, I thought I had fixed these, but all, all I'm doing here is taking the inverse Fourier transform uh, just like we did for the other free fields. So here's A as uh, in a Fourier expansion, 
we want expressions for the A and A star. So we multiply by the inverse Fourier transform and work it out. Um, you know, I'll, I'll fix this in the notes uh, and repost them. But uh, we get expressions much like we had before, certain combinations of A and A star given by the Fourier transform of A or by the Fourier transform of the, oh, of the conjugate momentum. So uh, by taking linear combinations of these, we can isolate the, um, the mode amplitudes. And those are what we want. Those are gonna be creation and annihilation operators. So this is exactly the kind of thing we've done before, but now all four components of A uh, are, um, are kept. Uh, so here's the solution for um, the, what will become the annihilation operator, you know, A minus the multiple of pi, you know, it's just like we had for the scalar field. We had that kind of combination before. Um, so working through uh, the, for the zero components, you get a similar thing. It's a little more complicated for the zero component because remember, it's, it's a linear combination of all four polarizations. So you you have to um, you have to substitute the pre previous solutions for that, and you you have a, a fairly lengthy thing that actually boils down by the time you solve it to um, uh, very much the same form. So the the final results for the I don't know why it's insisting on selecting everything, but uh, this pair of equations gives the um, gives all four modes here lambda lambda's one through three here and here's the zero component but they all have similar forms just the the vector potential and uh, the conjugate momentum in uh, this linear combination so then we we quantize that we have the conjugates you just take the complex conjugate and then you canonically quantize. And now notice that our quantization is uh, Lorentz covariant. That is, uh, we don't have a projection operator on the right. We now have the Minkowski metric between as the uh, commutator of A and its conjugate momentum. And from this, we can work out the commutators of A and A dagger. And here's where we run into um, what is this? This is a really anomalous thing, the solution of which is exactly the answer we're after. So, uh, you know, at first it's awful and then it's really nice. So here's what happens. A, a with a dagger um, for, the, and this is for um, the, the space-like modes, lambda, lambda prime equal to one, two, three. They give just what you would think, a chronicer and a direct delta function, equal time commutators. But for the zero component, and I did this a number of times, I was so pleased it worked out right. It comes out with a minus sign. And that's disastrous um, because we use the annihilation operators to define our space of states. So what we do is we set up a space of states uh, by or we set a, we, we define a, a, a vacuum as that state annihilated by all nine operators. That A should have a hat on it. That's an operator. And uh, what happens is if we act with a time like a dagger, then um, the commutation relation, you know, what you do is you, you look at the norm of a state created by a zero dagger. You know, it's proportional to just a zero dagger acting on the vacuum. And if you look at the norm of that state, then you find the norm by commuting uh, this a naught past that a dagger. So you write these in the opposite order plus a commutator. Well, now this a zero acting on the vacuum gives zero by definition, but the commutator has the wrong sign and you come out with a negative norm state. Negative norm states mean you don't have a Hilbert space. You need a positive defi definite norm to have a Hilbert space. So uh, what, um, 
the Gupta Bloiler uh, technique does is to um, first decompose the divergence of the A operator in, into a, an annihilation and a creation piece. You know, it certainly does that. And let's call those um, D mu, A mu, plus and minus. Uh, plus being creation, minus being annihilation. And then we're gonna restrict the states to those that are annihilated by that, um, the annihilation part of that divergence. And this turns out to be the right thing to do. Okay, if, uh, if a state is annihilated by, um, by that divergence, the, the annihilation part of that divergence, and we require this of every physical state now. Um, if, that, if that is true, then uh, the remaining states, the states that actually satisfy this, that um, uh, on, on which this gives zero, uh, those, those states will not have negative norm. So uh, this is weaker than imposing d mu a mu equals zero from the start. You know, all we're doing here is restricting the, the space of all states. So we start with the space of states um, that, uh, all right, you, you define it's not really quite the vacuum, but you, uh, I called it uh, zero tilde here. You define this state as the state annihilated by all of the annihilation operators. And then uh, the space of states, uh, the total space of states is acting on that state with arbitrary raising operators, A daggers. Okay, now what we're gonna do is look at the subspace of S um, given by uh, only those states annihilated by uh, D mu A mu minus. And uh, I, th I think I actually show that um, now all of the remaining states have non-negative norm. Uh, this, this is sufficient and probably the weakest condition you could oppose to ensure that, well, now she wants quantum field theory. Um, what, what? No, oh, come on, come on. All right, you, you scamp. Um, <clears throat> This is probably the weakest condition you can impose that will uh, uh, guarantee no negative norm states. And notice we're doing this at the, at the end, not at the beginning of the calculation. So we're gonna go ahead, quantize everything, do everything covariantly. And, uh, but then our space of states is restricted to this subspace where we have no negative norms. Unfortunately, that's still not quite a Hilbert space. There's a little bit more. Um, the, uh, there are still some states with zero norm and a Hilbert space needs positive definite norm. Um, so, so now let's see, uh, the raising, now some, somehow this, uh, this set of notes isn't the most recent set of notes I, I've modified this. I, I actually went through and construct um, all of the states annihilated by this negative operator. And uh, it turns out that they are linear combinations of the plus operator acting on the vacuum and the transverse modes. So, uh, so we, actually, we actually have a way to, to write the set of states that um, satisfy that restriction. They're, they're linear combinations of states like this, where we act with D, D mu, A mu plus, and, um, and the transverse modes. Now, the weird thing here is that these states created by uh, D mu, A mu plus have zero norm. So what happens is you, you look at the norm, it depends on this uh, null vector dotted into the polarizations and the sum over polarizations um, looks like eta. So you end up with the, uh, that, that sum ends up with the inner product of two 
null vectors and give zero. And that's, that's the reason we still have some negative norm states. Um, fortunately, uh, they don't do anything. Gosh, let's see, I'm, I'm, let, 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 me, let me scroll down a second and let's see. Um, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe this is where I did it. Uh, so these, these states, even, even two different states of that type. So if we've got one null vector M and another null vector M, uh, what happens is when we commute the A dagger and the A in the norm, um, right? This part annihilates the vacuum but the commutator survives and that commutator involves uh, an, an eta lambda lambda prime, which gives you uh, an, an eta mu nu when, it com when, when this eta combines with the two polarization vectors, you get an eta mu nu. So yeah, this combination gives eta mu nu, that gives the norm of the null vector and that's zero. So even, even two different states, when you look at their norm, uh, you're, you're going to get delta type stuff and it's going to go away. Um, also, these states are orthogonal to the transverse modes. Um, uh, these, these modes are actually longitudinal and uh, it's, it's not hard to see that they all come out be, because um, because this N is orthogonal to those transverse polarizations. Uh, the, um, you know, the, let me say it more clearly. This N depends on the, the three vector wave vector. That's orthogonal to the transverse modes. So, so this N is orthogonal to the two transverse states, which we already saw with the physical ones. So now any state of uh, this, a linear combination of a transverse mode and one of those uh, zero norm modes, uh, you, because that zero norm mode is orthogonal to everything, uh, the norm of such a state is equal to the norm of the transverse modes. So it doesn't contribute to the norm of any four vector. So now you let B, B hat be any observable and you look at expectation values um, in any of these linear combination states, you look at expectation values of B, you insert an identity for B, this is just the kind of thing we do in quantum mechanics, we insert an identity operator. And now uh, this expresses that expectation value in terms of a product of inner products of the beta state with one of these superposition states. And we've just showed that that's independent of, uh, uh, that, that that's equal to the transverse part. The, the inner product of, uh, one of one of these expansions with any state is going to depend only on the transverse mode. So, so these two factors in here actually depend only on the transverse modes, which means that the expectation values of any observable uh, are going to uh, are equal to the expectation values in the transverse part. And that means that uh, that that's an equivalence relation, right? So whatever whatever multiple of these phi states we add here uh, makes no contribution to any physical measurement. And so um, we define an equivalence relation where any states with uh, uh, such linear combinations are regarded as equivalent. And so the physical measurements uh, depend only on the quotient space, the, the quotient by that equivalence relation of, of the, the space with the non-negative norm subspace of the full space. So two reductions here. 
we, uh, we eliminate the negative norm states by requiring all physical states to be annihilated by the divergence of A minus. And then we show that all um, states with zero norm uh, form an equivalence class of states where all expectation values of observables uh, have uh, the same value throughout the equivalence classes. So we take a quotient of that reduced space by the equivalence classes, and that is a Hilbert space. Whew. That was all pretty cool to work through, actually. Um, I come in recommend uh, going through the notes on that. Um, other questions? How, how are you guys doing? I'm pretty good right now. Okay. So, so, so yeah. what would be what's a physical interpretation of the of of the orthogonal field? Uh, is this is this some type of yeah? Uh huh. What's a physical interpretation? The, those those guys are longitudinal modes of of our vector potential, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, all right. Physically, they correspond to um, modes of the A field that. Uh, are the components in the direction of motion. So those, those are longitudinal as opposed to transverse modes of A mu. Um, and we've, we've constructed our space of states in such a way that they don't contribute to any physical measurements. But um, you, you could write a theory where they do, uh, right? You, you could write a different theory and you know give that field masses and stuff. And, so uh, talking about a general vector field in quantum field theory, uh, you know, there's no reason it couldn't have a longitudinal mode. Here for electromagnetism, we've structured things in such a way that, the, um, that there is no uh, physical consequence of the longitudinal mode. Uh, we've done it by restricting our space of states. Okay. Is it like, is it like, number of photons like on the light cone or something it it almost looks like it's some some measure on the light cone that no, we're on, not on the light cone the um the d mu a mu modes are the ones on the light cone uh, uh you might call those null modes null or time-like modes uh, yeah they're not really time-like uh so there are null modes that are along the light cone then there are longitudinal modes that are in the direction of the space-like uh, momentum vector. And then there are transverse modes, two transverse modes that are spatial and perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So we have all four of those modes in our quantum description, and then we restrict the Hilbert space to be, well, the Hilbert space, importantly, but also to depend only on the transverse modes. Are the are the plus and minus on the light cone, or are they on the boundary of the light cone? Those almost look like they're they're on like the, boundary the plus, of boundary. The plus and minus, no. The uh, no, I think they're um, like they're, I, they're, they're yeah. creating and annihilating modes along the light cone. Those those are those are null modes right there. All right, so those modes lie along the light cone. Just the derivative operator makes it look like it's a boundary of the A, the A field along the light cone. Like their boundary uh, conditions on A on the light cone, like boundary on boundary. Uh, let's see. So you want to integrate the divergence somehow and um, get a get a boundary term. Um, yeah, maybe there's some way to do that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is like a quantization of the boundary of the light cone of A, and then that's giving us an integration condition on these spurious um, uh, uh, no, modes? No, no, okay. that's not what we're doing. Uh, I'm not saying that one couldn't do that, but that's not what we're doing here. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's see, uh, where would you be integrating this? You know, I suppose if you were looking for conservation laws or something, Perhaps there's a representation of this on the boundary of the light cone. I don't know. Uh, that's possible. That's possible. Um, but I, I haven't seen that. Um, maybe there is. Maybe there is. You don't need to do this to show this equivalence relation and, and restrict the states. 
So uh, moving right along, because there's a, a lot I really would like to cover today. The, um, the green function or the propagator uh, for this, we do the same thing. We write the, um, the field equation. And again, that, that operator is invertible. So we get, we get some matrix here uh, dependent upon inverting this, uh, this factor. But as I say, this factor for any finite psi is invertible. And so we can, we can always, uh, you know, unlike when we had to use a projection operator, uh, this operator is invertible. And so we can solve for D. Uh, let's see. So and I talked about that a little bit, but that's, that's the basic gist here is uh, you can, you can find the inverse. So I find it uh, just, ass I assume the inverse has to be a combination of um, a chronicer and a pair of Ks. And I find functions alpha and beta that make it work. And they turn out to be these. So the, uh, the net effect is that the propagator is this. And uh, you see one over the k squared here, or minus i over k squared. Um, that's the usual one over the wave operator in uh, momentum space. And then this other factor is just the, the inverse of uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, that added psi part. Uh, here, here is where we're going to take advantage of the independence of psi and take psi equal to 1. Uh, that term becomes zero and our propagator for the photon field is uh, simply proportional to the Minkowski metric over k squared. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple propagator. And uh, let's see, some, somewhere in, well, somewhere in all of this, I, I made an argument that, uh, that Nothing, none of our physical choices actually depend on what value we choose for psi. Um, it may follow from that restriction to the Hilbert space. Um, I forget right now. <laughs> I spent the last three days doing QED calculations, so I, my thinking is off somewhere else. I wrote this a, a week or so ago. Um, so here's, here's the theory that we're going to analyze. Uh, we're, um, we, we have a free Dirac field. We have a free modified Maxwell field and we have a single interaction term. So our interaction Hamiltonian is going to depend on this factor. Notice that it is polynomial in the fields, psi bar, A and psi. And, uh, then there is a, um, a coefficient matrix that connects all of those, uh, some constants times a gamma matrix. So it's, it's that factor, uh, if you think back to the scalar field examples, it's uh, where, where we associated an I lambda with each, with each order in perturbation theory. Here, we're gonna have a factor of minus IE gamma alpha um, for each vertex, for each order in perturbation theory. So we quantize the operators and we have a pretty good idea what these mean. We define the vacuum as the uh, space annihilated by all the annihilation operators. We restrict the photon space as described earlier. And uh, that should not have a dagger on it. I gotta get rid of that dagger. But um, other than that, these are our fields and uh, the interpretation is this A annihilates uh, an electron or creates a positron? Uh, this, um, I, I, I saved this file right before, I hope I haven't lost some stuff because I, I fixed this uh, somewhere. I don't, I don't know why this is the older version, but anyway, um, uh, this, this should be psi dagger. And so that would be A dagger and this would be B. B annihilates a positron and creates an electron. So, so either you annihilate the particle and create the antiparticle or vice versa. 
and then um, the A mu uh, will annihilate or create a photon. Okay, so um, now we're in a position to do QED. Um, the, we look at first order processes and uh, all right, remember we're talking about an interaction that involves its polynomial in those three fields. So uh, we can um, uh, uh, create a photon, annihilate a photon here and uh, produce a positron and an electron. Uh, but these diagrams rotate any way you can imagine. Uh, these are all of the, the first order QED scattering uh, diagrams. And the interesting thing about these is none of them can conserve momentum. That is pretty easy to check. These, these last two, uh, the, um, these bottom two, uh, they produce something out of nothing or nothing out of something. They clearly cannot conserve momentum. But the other, none of the other four can either. If, if we look at the uh, pair creation or electron positron annihilation uh, diagrams, these two on the left, the problem here is you can go to the center of mass frame for the electron and positron, and then they have opposite these. And so the total momentum coming in here or going out there is uh, gamma, uh, there should probably be an M, gamma M times C zero would be the, um, with a factor of two. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, put an M on everything and put a factor of two on this one. And um, the total momentum of the system in the rest frame, the center of mass frame of the electron positron is 2M times gamma C zero. That's not a null vector. So that cannot turn into or, um, or arise from a photon which has to be a null vector. So neither of those diagrams can conserve momentum. Uh, then for the, uh, the scatterings where an electron scatters and sends off a, a gamma or a, a positron scatters emitting a, a, a photon. Um, if you look at conservation of momentum here, all right, you have M gamma CV is the initial momentum vector for say the electron. And that has to turn into the, uh, um, mo the four, four dimensional wave vector for the photon. Um, plus, all right, here what I've done is to write, the, uh, write this diagram in the rest frame of the final electron. So boost to the rest frame of this final electron, um, then you have a general incoming for momentum has to equal this null vector plus mc0. And if you just uh, square that equation, all right, the, the four dimensional uh, square of any four momentum for a massive particle is the mass squared. And when we square this one, we're gonna get another m squared on that side. When we take the absolute square of the null vector, we get zero. So then we also get the inner product of these two vectors, which is uh, two gamma m um, speed of light times k. Uh, you can only satisfy that if you have zero photon momentum. So none of these processes conserve momentum. These don't occur in isolation. This doesn't mean you can't pair produce from a photon. What you have to do is like stick a nucleus out here that can absorb some momentum or something. There, there are some field theory techniques that let you um, pair produce near some other thing that can soak up the extra momentum. So uh, there are ways to make some of these diagrams occur. Yeah, or maybe gravity. Yeah, strong gravitational field and you create these particles out of the gravity. That'd be fun. Okay, so, um, oh, this, this is the old stuff on earth, let's see. Uh, um, no, that's, that's distressing. 
Um, yeah, because the version I'm working with is definitely not under construction anymore. We've, we've done all this. Yeah, let, me, let me see. What's the date? Oh, March, April. I probably saved the wrong version of this. Um, March, 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 31st of March. Now we're going to, we're going to want the right version here. Um, all right, hang on. Uh, so theory. Let's see, April. Let's see, what's, uh, what's the date here? April 26th. Um, and first yesterday, okay, let's, let's get that one open. And um, no, we can work right in the Lix file. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I thought I had fixed those um, errors. Typos, yeah, this looks better. So, uh, okay, we're down to first order processes and those, those are not conserved. So now we wanna look at the Feynman rules for QED. And uh, a lot of these are similar or the same as those we found for the scalar fields. So um, spinner fields, uh, all right, I, I'm going to explain this. Oh, but I did that, hang on. Uh, where did I do it? Yeah. Okay, here, this section wasn't there. Sorry, I was looking at an old version. Um, yeah, I try to put the time and date of the version on the Canvas site. So, all right, what I did here in this section, and, you know, I'm going to let you read this. Uh, I just want to um, convince you that this is actually right. Um, that, that weird calculation where we inserted a time integral and a time derivative and we manipulated the, the field equation to get a um, scalar field operator, a Klein-Gordon operator um, associated with each external line of the Feynman diagrams. And it seemed odd to me that we could go right to um, rules for QED <clears throat> without repeating that calculation for the Dirac equation, which is first order. So, you know, there's, it's not at all obvious that it's going to work the same way. Amazing. It does. It works. It's just right. Um, so uh, I, I went through that calculation again here. And what happens is interesting because, right, you, you insert a time derivative, turn this into a four-dimensional integral uh, along about here by adding a time derivative and a time integral. So you make it four dimensional and you, you do some integrations by parts and you use the Dirac equation to uh, replace some of the time derivatives by spatial derivatives. And sure enough, uh, you, you end up getting in, in this case, the, the conjugate Dirac equation um, here. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, in the momentum space, you get you get a factor like this. So uh, the pre-factor, when when we're writing out all these, um, you know, using Wick's theorem to write all these propagators, we had these pre-factors that were box plus m squared for each scalar field, for each momentum we wanted to get rid of. Okay, now instead of that, what we have is uh, it's it's a Dirac operator and a basis spinner. And the, the propagators that we're gonna put in depend on uh, the, prop, right, the propagator. Remember, I pointed out that the green function had to be a matrix valued thing. Um, 
So the propagator is only one over k slash minus m. It does not include the basis spinner, this, this u. That's still there. So when we get cancellations between the propagators, the poles from the propagators and the zeros from the wave equation in, uh, on the external lines in the asymptotic region, those cancel. Well, the cancellation now is not quite complete. The, the k slash minus m cancels with the propagator, but the basis spinner does not, which means when we write our Feynman diagrams, we have to include that basis spinner uh, as uh, associate that basis spinner with the external lines. Okay, so coming back to where I'm writing Feynman rules, uh, this is one of the first things I'm saying is that we have to uh, we have to assign one of these basis spinners to each external line of the diagram. If we have an external photon line, uh, I don't know. Yeah, if I wrote that, um, yeah, the the photon line similarly requires the polarization vectors. Those don't cancel. The k squared is going to cancel um, with the propagator, but the polarization vector is going to survive. So now, unlike the scalar field, with external lines, we need to associate a polarization vector for a photon or a basis spinner for a fermion. Otherwise, uh, we um, uh, for internal lines, we require a propagator. Any, any line internal to the diagram, we get a propagator. Uh, whether it's a photon or a fermion. Uh, the vertex com uh, um, contribution we saw is this minus i e gamma mu. Uh, I believe the sign convention here is that this e is uh, the positive uh, electronic charge. So you put a minus one in here if you have negative charges. Uh, so it becomes, that'll become plus. Uh, all the indices have to balance. Um, you're working in two spaces at once. You're working in spinner space and you're working in space time. And the, the, the matrix element we're constructing has to be a scalar in both of those. So uh, you've got a, um, uh, the photon propagator has two Lorentz indices on it and it's a you know, scalar in spinner space. The Dirac propagator is a matrix in spinner space and a scalar in space time. The vertex operator is a matrix in spinner space and a vector in space time. All those have to, van uh, to come together to give you scalars. You also have basis spinners on the external lines. So uh, what, what has to happen in the, the, the Feynman rules ultimately is that we build those into scalars. So now if we, if we look at the interaction, okay, we said first order interactions don't happen. So let's, let's look here at second order interactions. All right, so we've got two factors of psi gamma A, all right, that's an A slash times another psi. Those, those could be anything. These guys could be, you know, any fermions and some photons. So, uh, if we look at if we look at one of those factors, um, you've you've got uh, yeah. So suppose just for concreteness that we have a um, a fermion coming in, say an electron comes in, emits a photon that does something else uh, with the other factor and goes off as an electron. So electron in, electron out, and a photon exchanged. So we're going to have a propagator for that photon. Um, here, we're gonna we're gonna have a a factor like this where um, the u1 bar is the uh, electron going out, the u2 is the electron coming in, and they're sandwiched around a gamma matrix. So those we've seen are are um, those are those are real factors, right? In fact, that's that's essentially the Dirac current, the, the current produced by that electron. That alpha is gonna 
contract on the alpha in the photon propagator, then there's another current on the other side. So say we have, um, uh, oh, say, say we have an electron and a positron coming in, exchanging a photon and scattering off. Then um, one, of these, one of these currents from uh, the future, future U1 to past U2 um, around the gamma, right? That's, that's say the electron current uh, then between them, the exchanged photon, and then finally the positron current over on the other side. And notice the alpha and beta are fully contracted. So those are now dummy indices. This is a Lorentz scalar. And the fact that we're uh, using our inner product, U bar gamma alpha U, um, that U bar, remember, includes our H, our metric. Um, that is a spinner space scalar. So we've got two spinner space scalars that form space-time vectors contracted on, um, actually is contracted over here on the space-time metric. So this is in fact a scalar. And this is typical of the form of the factors that come into these Feynman diagrams. So let's see, um, yeah, we see the currents. Uh, now, what else happens? Um, yeah, if they exchange, if the exchange is an exchange with a, a, a fermion exchange between photons, um, then we have the polarizations. So say, let's, uh, let me think, let me read what, uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, yeah, if we have an external photon. So let's see, what, what would happen if we, yeah, we, we have an electron positron come in each uh, emits a photon and then they, they annihilate. Uh, so uh, the diagram for that, the diagram for that would be something like this. Uh, can you see the board? Can you see the board here? Okay, so, uh, so you have something like this where uh, this is an E, this is an E plus going out, and that's the fermion here. You have photons going out. So you'd have polarization vectors with these final electrons like that. And so that's, that's what we're seeing here. So this factor, this first factor, uh, is the electron coming in. Uh, then there's a propagator for a fermion this time and the photon going out with the polarization vector. So, so now uh, that gets summed with the other uh, similar factor that has the positron uh, state and the, another gamma and the um, polarization. So this time the gamma matrices are summed on the polarization vectors. And uh, it's probably the completeness relation for the polarization vectors that'll give you some some final Lorentz invariant inner product of the um, of the gamma matrices, but you you end up with a product like this, where the um, you you write the fermion propagator as uh, p slash plus m over p squared. Uh, let's see, I have to check whether I should have p squared plus m or p squared minus m uh, in the denominator here. Um, I'm suddenly not sure about that. And then the polarization vectors contracted on the alpha and the beta here. So again, we've constructed a, a, a total scalar in both spaces. All right, so now um, here are our Feynman rules. Uh, we do the same thing. We, um, uh, we define the scattering matrix MFI, whoops, there, this, this guy here. We define M sub FI, the, the scattering matrix, um, by extracting the conservation of overall momentum times two pi to the fourth. So uh, it's this M that the Feynman rules allow us to write down directly, sort of. There's, uh, let, let me ask you guys with me here. Yep. Good. 
because uh, when we actually implement this, it gets complicated. All right, so uh, label the forward momentum of each line uh, and um, put, put arrows on the fermion line to indicate the direction of flow. So uh, in, in this diagram, uh, the electron moves from past to future. The positron moves from future to past. They're going backward in the light cone. So think of time roughly as up here. And uh, one property of these diagrams is that the fermion lines are always continuous. You always have a continuous fermion. I'm not sure what state this is <laughs> crossing here. It's a fermion propagator. Um, you know, you could, well, you could, you could orient this different ways. And let's not get into that at the moment. Now, uh, you write, you write the propagator for each internal photon line. So the, the photon propagator is basically the Minkowski metric over K squared. You write uh, the um, propagator for a fermion for each internal fermion line. External lines, we see that those, those cancel except for the basis uh, spinner. Uh, or the polarization. So we integrate each undetermined momentum, the internal momentum we integrate over. Um, we include a factor uh, minus I E N times gamma alpha, where N is the, the number of positive units of charge. So for an electron, N is minus one. Um, then uh, the, the index on that vertex factor has to has to be summed on something, either a, a photon propagator or a photon polarization. On each external line, you choose, uh, you know, one of these six things. You choose um, either the uh, um, any of the four basis spinners or the two um, sets of polarizations. Uh, just depending whether you have an initial state electron coming in from the past, a final state going out to the future, an initial state positron going out to the past, or a final state positron coming in from the future. Uh, photons, uh, you, um, you use the conjugate for the final state and uh, the unconjugate for the initial state. Okay, then uh, you draw all diagrams. Um, let's just talk about connected diagrams for now. Um, we'll deal with infinities this summer. But the, the total scattering matrix is now the sum of, right, apply those rules to each of the, um, uh, each of the Feynman diagrams at a given order. The, uh, then M is the sum of those diagrams. And the, the square of M, remember the square of M is what's going to be the probability for this interaction, is the square of the sum. And uh, this, is, this is very weird. I, I'm going to, well, well, I won't have time to run through it today, unfortunately. But um, let's see, when you do that, actually implement this, uh, let me see, where have I? written this out. Um, now, I've done an example here. Um, ah, where is it? You see what I mean? This gets long. Oh, yeah, you get these cross terms. When you square these things, you, you, get, you get products between two different diagrams, right? There's interference between two diagrams. You know, think, think of Dirac saying that the photon interferes with itself in a double slit experiment, right? You know, the, you know, these, these electrons coming in, they're, they're doing everything. You know, they're a superposition of all of these things. And you see interference effects of, um, of the different diagrams. So no one of these diagrams is what happens, right? They're all happening uh, in each instance. So um, yeah, what happens, these things get long because uh, right, I'm gonna show you a, a couple of tricks for working these things out, but 
Um, these interference terms uh, end up depending on products of eight gamma matrices and you end up with traces. So, so you have to get good at finding traces of products of gamma matrices. And um, this particular one has 105 terms. Uh, fortunately, there are tricks uh, so that you break that into little bits and don't do the whole thing at once. Um, what you do is you use these ADAs to, to reduce it down to lower order. Um, but uh, let me get back where I was and take this a step at a time. Uh, finish the rules. Um, all right. Uh, what you do then depends on uh, whether or not you measure the initial and final spins. Uh, most experiments, you, you don't measure the, the initial and final spins of the fermions. So, uh, so you just look at the average spin coming into the interaction, and then you sum over all the final spins. So your average over initial sum over final spins. Uh, that allows a simplification of a trick. Um, if, if you, uh, we saw some cases where you could interchange the particles in the final state. If you, if you interchange two fermions, you get a minus sign. Um, and uh, a way to write these things is to, uh, in, order, in order to write the, uh, like this, this final factor, right? You start, you start at the end of the line, you start to the future and you work your way back. So uh, this isn't the right picture here. So here I've labeled all the momenta and the particles coming in and going out. This is um, Baba scattering, uh, electron positron scattering. So in order to write the terms for this diagram, you start at the future, you write down mu two bar then you write the vertex function, then you write the initial state. And that, that leads to something, something like this, All right? Then uh, you write the propagator that goes between. And finally, you, you, follow, the, you follow the other line. So you start with the, um, uh, you follow the lines backwards, and that's why you put the arrows. So positrons are going to the past. So you start you start at the past with a v1 bar. You pick up the vertex function, and you get a v. So you're always writing things like currents here, right? So uh, diagrams like this are always uh, currents connected by a propagator. Here, uh, you start at this end and go back here. You start at this end and go back there. Where, where we have um, uh, uh, what, um, what physically we think of as electron positron annihilation into a photon and then pair production out here. Okay, so um, we've run out of time. And uh, I don't know how much of this you folks are prepared to do. So let me stop this share a minute and just uh, confront reality here. Um, <laughs> yeah, what what I what I had hoped to get far enough to do is to have you guys do Compton scattering. Um, but you're going to have to read my notes to do that. I worked through the example of Baba scattering. Uh, I've almost finished writing that up, uh, and. I think with the Feynman rules, you can write down the matrix elements for Baba or for for uh, Compton scattering. Compton, uh, perhaps you recall, is uh, where you've got you've got an electron coming in and a photon, and you know uh, you're going to have a propagator here and a photon scattering off. So you can have a line like this with the electron, or you know it could be arranged differently. I think. I think in that case, there are two diagrams you have to consider, um, but I'll, you know, that's, that's your final, right? So what I want you to do is carry Compton scattering as far as you can. Um, so write down the matrix element and uh, then um, 
in the notes in this chapter. So, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, really um, 10.7 here. Uh, uh, you know, look at my example. Um, I'm gonna give you, I have one section where I've got a couple of tips for reducing these products. Do not write out all 105 terms of a, a trace of eight gamma matrices. Uh, use the tricks that I describe. Um, you, you commute the gamma alphas pass and use the metrics. Eta alpha beta on a gamma alpha gamma beta is four, <laughs> number four. So you can reduce the number of gamma matrices using the metrics. Um, neglect masses, all right? Pretend you're at the LHC and the energy is 14 TeV and the mass of the electron is completely negligible compared to the energies involved. Um, part in a billion because it's squared. Uh, so drop masses or you'll, you're gonna be at it until uh, the 4th of July. Um, but yeah, if you, if you drop all the masses and use those tricks, uh, worst case, you're gonna need the trace of four gamma matrices. I've got it written out in there. It's just three terms, that's not bad. Um, so do all you can with Scott. Compton scattering, read my notes. And now uh, this, um, well, open book, uh, uh, read my book, but more to the point, open me, uh, you know, Zoom with me and uh, come with any questions and, you know, I'll help you through the calculation. I'll give you tips and stuff. So, you know, just be in touch with me, email me if there's a quick question or we can do a Zoom if you wanna work through something. But um, it will be a triumph if you're able to compute the actual cross section for Compton scattering. You know, it's it's not just a single term. The the Bamba scattering, you would think, okay, Rutherford cross section, right? Goes was one over sine to the fourth. No, no, no. They're like four terms, five terms. You know, it's it, the answer is much more complicated than Rutherford scattering. Um, so uh, being able to do a QED calculation is a substantial accomplishment. So, you know, turn in any other problems, uh, but I wanna see how much you can do of Compton scattering in the next week, let's say by Monday, but start right away because, you know, it's gonna take you a while to digest this new material. I wish we had a couple more weeks where I could, you know, step you through this, but, um, I'd like to see you guys try to, you know, write the matrix element, you know, for the two diagrams for Compton scattering and uh, do your best to reduce it uh, to, to find the M squared. Um, I'll give you the formula for, uh, you know, the, the next step, that's sort of halfway, right? The next step is to put in realistic physical variables. So you start with the electron at rest and write its formal momentum you send in a photon with some null vector, uh, you put all those in because the answers, um, here I'll share again to show you what, what these things end up looking like. Uh, what, you, what you get by the time you, um, it, you multiply these things out is, uh, oh yeah, here are the tricks. Um, and th those tricks are important, but okay. So, so one, one channel, um, you know, one of one of the four terms may end up looking something like this, where you have a products of dot products of momentum. So then you do the kinematics and you set it up. Oh, all right, P1 is an electron at rest. K1 is a photon. K2 is some other photon off at some angle from the first. And you put all those into the total formula you get when you add together four things like this. And uh, you, you make a physical prediction, which I don't think I've written down here yet. I didn't get that far. But let me, let me end show you these three tricks. Set M to zero or you're toast, all right? Um, the other thing you can do, okay, use the metrics to reduce products of gamma. So if you can commute a gamma through, you know, it adds a term each time you use the fundamental Clifford algebra relation to move gammas through, uh, you know, you have this kind of thing. But um, then 
uh, you can, um, you know, doing that, you can reduce reduce complicated expressions like uh, like this eightfold thing. You know, I'm able to break it down into some uh, pretty quickly. I got it down to traces of six gamma matrices, and with a little more work, I got it to four. Uh, the other trick, which you don't remember at all, is to use, uh, oh, wait, this is not, there's another trick. Um, use the uh, completeness. All right, so uh, where did I do that? I think I wrote this down. The completeness relation for the basis um, basis spinners. Rats, where, where did I have that? Um, wait a second. Uh, yeah, this this is a this is a crucial thing. Um, when all right, you're going to square this, so you're going to multiply this by its conjugate, and you're going to have. Uh, two copies of each base of spinner, one with a one bar and one not. The outer product of those can be written in terms of gamma matrices. Here it is, here it is. Okay, so you're gonna use this trick a bunch. This gets rid of all the basis spinners. Um, so you, you read this section carefully, and I know some of you need to get going, but um, Right. Notice this is not V bar V, this is V V bar. This is an outer product of the two spinners. And we're dealing with the case where we're summing over all spins. We're not measuring the final spins. If you go back to previous chapter where we found these completeness relations, um, we, um, each, uh, each separate product could be represented in terms of or each spinner could be represented in terms of these, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was, it was outer products of spinners, could be written in terms of the two projection operators, the energy and spin projection operators. So, you know, one of these projects the spin, one the energy. And if you add together the spins, that, that spinner part cancels out and you just get something that's uh, M minus P slash or P slash minus M or P slash plus M for the U's. Those relationships let you remove all of the basis spinners from these. The whole thing reforms into uh, a trace or a product of two traces of gamma matrices. So by the time you use that trick here, okay, so here I've replaced, whoa, what, did, what was that? Um, here I've replaced one of these pairs, that pair with a K slash minus M. And then down here a little further, I've replaced, um, let's see, where is it? Down here, I've replaced all of them. Bearing in mind that you get a minus sign every time you interchange a pair of spinners. I think it might always come out positive, but check. But what you get then is this product, um, you, you can rearrange these things, right? So move move the U's and V's bars over to the right of the U's and V's. Uh, make sure it's the same one. Put the, put the indices on so you know what's contracted with what. Replace, replace the um, uh, products with K slash minus M or P slash plus M uh, according to the completeness relations. And then uh, now everything's bosonic and you, you can rearrange these things in order. So this one, for example, right? The normal order for matrix products is summing inside indices. So here's A contracted with, uh, with A up there, then a B contracted with a B in that term and the G is contracted with G. And notice the final H here is contracted with the initial H on that one. That's a trace. So this always will work out to be the trace of some product of gamma matrices. Now you're gonna set all the M's to zero. 
that's going to simplify things. So this particular trace works out to the trace of the product of four gammas, which is really pretty easy to write. Um, you know, the, the interference terms, they all couple, all, all eight gammas. Um, higher order interactions, of course, it's even more complicated. But uh, this reduces finding these squared matrix elements to um, finding traces of gamma matrices and keeping track of the, the momentum factors. So um, this is not quite as much as I had hoped to be through by this point, but uh, students who took quantum field theory one and two in a sequence with me uh, a few years back got to this point about halfway through the second semester. So you guys are doing great. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about your progress. You're, you're getting a lot of stuff very quickly and I think you're learning it. Um, but I would, I would love to see you able to actually, you know, calculate a differential cross section for a, a real quantum electrodynamic interaction. So let's work on this together. You know, I'll get these notes posted so you can read through uh, the basic rules and the, um, the, the tricks and, you know, see how I do it. Uh, then try it with Compton scattering. So be in touch. Okay. Don't, don't hesitate to, uh, you know, text or email or, you know, we can zoom, whatever, uh, whatever it takes to get you as far as we can in this week. I realize this is all very quick and, uh, my my expectations are you know hedged accordingly um but uh yeah i you know follow the rules i think you'll be okay so gosh this this has been fun now uh one more thing um let's make this do uh, next monday say uh you know show me what you've got make sure you've turned in problem one as well uh has everybody turned that in do I have your problem one? If you haven't sent me problem one, send me problem one. Um, uh, you know, I'll look at that closely as well. So um, otherwise, I'm assuming you've really done most of the exercises. I'm looking sternly at you in case you haven't. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Uh, but um, what else? Uh, some of us are continuing this summer. Um, we may want a week off or something, you know, uh, give ourselves a little bit of a break. But um, let's uh, let's see uh, who who is sticking with this this summer. Okay, uh, Guillermo, are you are you there? Well, you yeah, got, I'm here. Are Are you going to try and do it this summer or no? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure. Oh, I'm okay, have to so check it out. really, most of you. Okay, so let's. Um, Let's zoom again next Monday. All right, uh, and um, you know, uh, yeah, same time, same place next Monday. Let's let's all touch base, uh, or you know, email me if that time doesn't work. I, I don't know what the exam schedule is, but um, let's uh, let's try and figure out a time. You know, it could be all one day. You know, we could have a you know massive long session or we can have short ones, you know, we can do it however we like. Um, you can get credit for it in any future term. Uh, you feel like putting it in uh, and, you know, I'll give you credit after the fact. But um, I expect I'll see you all before Monday. Let's, let's call that enough for now. Give it a try. Uh, I, I need to post this this example stuff. I haven't put that up. I'll, I'll get that up soon. So um, good luck. Stay in touch. All right. Bye-bye right. now. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. You bet. Yeah. Uh, have, a nice, have a nice day, Professor. I'll, yeah. I'll call you if I have any problems. Okay, great. I'll see you, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.